just thanks very much for that. Now I'm going to call on Mary Delaney, uh, and maybe the speakers are, are getting mic'd up for session two as well. I'll call on Mary. And Mary is a, a sustainability and business leader with over 20 years experience in the sector. Mary is a Nuffield scholar and now a member of the board of Nuffield Ireland as well. And Mary farms alongside her husband David in Kilkenny as well, even though I think you're from Monaghan, uh, Mary, which, which in your role as Mary Comiskey, you were before the Monaghan, people would remember you. You're, you're, you're a member of the senior management team of the Agricultural Trust, which, which uh, publishes the Irish Farmers Journal, the Irish Field, amongst others, until recently. You spent 13 years before that with Glombia. Uh, and you are president of the Agricultural Science Association as well. So I don't know where you fit all that into a very busy life, Mary, but we're, we really appreciate you joining us today. And I'll hand over you to take this session. Thank you. So thanks very much, Damien. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here. And um, so the first session really focused on the economic contribution of the agri-food sector and, and the impact it has and the multiplier effect it has on the rural economy. But I suppose this section is more about the emissions, the science and the targets. So if I may, I might just bring you back just a little bit, maybe to 2015, to the Paris Agreement, which was an international treaty which committed to limiting global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius and get as close to 1.5 degrees Celsius as possible. And Ireland was one of the countries which signed up to this, one of 196 countries. And as part of that, it ultimately committed to a legally binding target of reducing our Irish emissions by 51% by 2030 and achieving a climate neutral economy no later than 2050. So to do all this, the Climate Change Advisory Council were mandated to set carbon budgets over three periods, um, out to 2025, from 25 to 30, and from 30 to 35. And this was agreed in April of last year. And fo following that, in July of last year, the Climate Change Advisory Council came out with um, sectorial emission ceilings. And what all that means for agriculture is that ultimately, we need to reduce our emissions by 25% by 2030. And how are we going to do that? And if I just refer back to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, when they said we needed to implement the climate change, or implement the Paris Agreement, excuse me, what was required was economic and social transformation based on the best available science. And that stands true for us as well, that we need to change our mindset, we need the support on the ground, and we need the financial incentives to uh, apply the measures that come from the best available science to achieve our target. And that's what our session is about today. It's the scientific debate, the scientific dialogue, perhaps. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce our panel. So we have Tig Buckley, who is Director of Policy with the IFA. We have Lawrence Shalhoub, who's Head of Animal and Grassland Research and Innovation with Chagas. We have Bill Callanan, Chief Inspector with the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. We have Mary Frances Rochford, Programme Manager um, climate change in the Environmental Protection Agency, and we have Professor Peter Thorne, climatologist with the University of Ireland in Maynooth. You're all very welcome. <laughs> so the, the format is just going to be two presentations from Tyg and Lawrence, and then we're going to have a panel discussion. So Tyg, I'd like to ask you to come and, and go with the first presentation. Uh, thanks, thanks to me and Mary, and. Uh, First of all, uh, thanks to me for the, the for all the, the numbers turning out today in such big numbers. I think it's really uh, it's really testament to how uh, how serious farmers are taking this issue. And um, so I suppose what I'm going to speak about here, I'm going to take about 10 minutes. I'm going to speak mainly about the actual the climate action plan, the 2023 climate action plan, which was just announced before Christmas. So I'm going to go through what the the details of that of what's in that plan in terms of how the pathway to 25% and then briefly speak, touch off of uh, one or two other, uh, I think, relevant issues on that issue, which is relating to nitrates and also land use. So just so first of all, this, and uh, as we will get the presentations emailed out to you afterwards as well to, uh, for all attendees today. So it's um, uh, in terms of making sure you can see the presentations afterwards. So first of all, this table here is simply setting out what the, the, the climate action plan or the, the sectoral targets that were set last year for all sectors. So you can see that the, the, the six main sectors, there's electricity, transport, buildings, agriculture, and LULUCF, which is land use, land use change and forestry. So there was five targets set out, which uh, range from 75% for, for electricity to 25% for agriculture, 
The Lulu CF target has not been set yet. That will, there's a land use change survey, survey being done on that, study being done on that first. So it's expected those targets will be set out um, sometime in 2024. So you can see there that the ranges, and on the face of it, you could say, well, 25% for agriculture, you know, it's, 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 um, it's a good outcome relative to some of the other sectors. But I think that that is probably a simplistic way of looking at it because to the agriculture by its nature, it's much more challenging for agriculture in terms of reducing emissions relative to some other sectors who do have um, pathways to, uh, to decarbonizing, uh, more, maybe more straightforward. However, I think it's fair to say, I'd say two things, and this is, the Taoiseach said this before Christmas, agriculture is probably one of the sectors that is, is, has a plan and is looking at developing a plan. A lot of the other sectors, there's a plan there, but not, re I mean, how realistic the plans are and how together the industry is in terms of discussing it in their, within their sectors is, I would say, is, is not at the same level that agriculture is at. So when we talk about the plan, so what I, what's outlined here is, so th there was two sections set out in terms of the, of the plan, the 2023 plan. There's the core actions identified and then there's the additional actions. So the core actions are, uh, they're listed here, so to go, I'll we'll just go through them briefly, reducing uh, um, inorganic nitrogen, and, and the target there to reduce is by 25% by the end of the decade. And in fairness, if you look at the usage in 2023, or 2022, we've, we've already a chunk of that uh, journey traveled. Second one is looking at increasing um, the, the widespread adoption of protected urea. And that's something that we, we, we've, we, there's, it has certainly increased significantly, but one of the big challenges of protected urea, as anyone that is involved in farming knows, is, is sourcing it and also being able to source it at the right times of the year because there's, there's an expiry challenge with, with protected urea. Um, you, then the other things like earlier finishing of, of beef cattle, which is, a de, um, which is looking at continuing the trend that has been there for the last 11 or 12 years in terms of reducing the, the average age, not every animal now, but the average age across the entire industry, reducing age of calving, uh, improving animal breeding. So in other words, identifying animals, the ICBF are doing a lot of work on this, identifying um, low uh, methane emitting animals that we can breed from. Um, and, and, and that's a very important thing to, to, to focus on as well, and that will need um, additional support. Uh, increasing organic farming area, which there's a, an ambition to increase it to six times the current area that we have by 2030. Um, then there's improved animal feeding, which is speaking about reducing the, the crude protein levels in feed when cows are, uh, and, and other livestock are at grass, using feed added as a grass. I'm not going to touch on that too much because I know Lawrence is covering it in his one. And then there's uh, uh, extended grading and, and slurry additives. And again, I know... Um, Lawrence is covering that as well. So when you put those together, they come to something between 15 and 17 percent. Now, and I think one of the, th the issues with the, the like, when we, when we look at agriculture and the climate debate, there's been absolute, complete and utter focus on the 25 percent figure, which is understandable. But there's, I mean, we can only get to, 20, you have to pass through 15 to get to 25. And there's a lot of stuff up on that page there, that sheet, that we need to start doing and we need to start doing now, and we can get the, the emissions redu reducing. And, they, and so, I, I, so we know like we have the, 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 the higher figure, but I think maybe we need to be looking at it. It's like a fellow say, how do you eat an elephant? Well, it's one bite at a time. So like we, you, know, you, you have to start somewhere and start the journey. And a lot of that is something that, and again, but farmers will need to be supported to do this because, and it's, it's, there's financial support, but there's more than that as well. If you take protected urea, for instance, you need to, it needs to be there when they go to the, their, their merchants to be able to purchase it. You look at, say, the, the incorporation of clover or multi-species swords. That will need a lot of advice on the ground for farmers because it's not straightforward, particularly in different land types. So then we move on to the, to the additional measures. So there's, the additional measures then is, the, I suppose, enhancing the use of a feed additive, which is like trying to expand it to use it at grass. So the first page, it was being used uh, uh, indoors. Then there's also what's classified as diversification from livestock farming into anaerobic digestion. So the, the uh, Climate Action Plan uh, targets the production of 5.7 terawatt hours of biomethane by 2030. Now, to, to, that is, it's, it's seriously ambitious. 
I suppose there's a couple of things that I think we need to look at with that is um, the, the whole way of the, the, the credit that comes from that in terms of the mitigation of emissions that's happening there are very little that will go to agriculture. Um, and as well as that, it's a significant amount of land that is potentially going to be uh, uh, rooted in there. And I suppose the question then is, what will that, and, and it's more than just um, the AD side of it, but it's just, I think we have to make sure from a policy perspective that we're coherent across that because there's a real risk here, I think, that we, the land market could get completely disrupted because there's a whole host of different measures which I'll maybe focus on a bit uh, in, in later slide. And then there's also diverse, looking at increasing the area under tillage uh, to 400,000 hectares by 2030, which is about 51,500 hectares more than we have at the moment. And in fairness, there was a, a, an incentive scheme that was put in place for 2022, and that did see the area under tillage growing in Ireland uh, last year, which I think is, is, is a positive. So, um, and you put those two together and you come to 25%, to, to which sounds great on paper, but obviously it's, it's, not as, it's not as easy as that, unfortunately. Now, so the, then we look at Lulu CF, which is the, the land use, land use change and forestry uh, targets. Now, there's no numbers put in the, in the climate action plan as of yet because of um, there's a uh, further study going on. But there is numbers put in, in terms of what uh, hectares um, of ambition. So in terms of afforestation, the aim is to have an additional 68,000 hectares under forestry by 2030. Um, looking at improving carbon sequestration on mineral soils, and that's targeting about, you know, just over 10% of the land in the, in the country, because actually if you drain mineral soils, you reduce emissions from a land use perspective. It's the opposite to, to organic soils. And then there's, um, in the thing, there's, in the plan, there's uh, reduce the farming intensity on, on, on drained organic soils. This is the, um, I'm taking this directly from the, the climate action plan, and that's, targeting 80,000 hectares of drained organic soils to be farmed at reduced intensity. Um, and then there's also wetlands, which is to look at, to be funded and rehabilitated, 41,000 hectares of wetlands. So, uh, and that's on the Lulu CF side of it. So now if you put that, uh, so that's the, the Climate Action Plan and Lulu CF. So the other thing I just want to touch on is the Nitrates Action Program. I'm not going to go into it in any significant detail, but. Um, I suppose one of the things that we would have done there is looked at ourselves, look at modelling and say, well, what will the Nitrates Action Plan uh, uh, programme, if, if we have to reduce from 250 to 220 organic uh, in, in, in 2024, what impact could that have? And that could potentially soak up another 28,000 hectares of land. And we all know it's happening already because people will see it in the land market. So that, that impact there is something that is going to have a direct uh, uh, issue, create significant potential issues if you're going to use, try and use land for other things as well because you're, you know, you have a finite resource and you're, you're, putting, you're putting a lot of pressure on that, that market. And, um, and I suppose the thing about the nitrates, to be fair, is like the water quality does, I think in fairness, we, we have to acknowledge right, that if you look at the water quality trends for the latter half of the last decade, they were declining, albeit from a, a, high, a high level, to be fair. We have one of the best water quality standards in Europe as it is. But they were, they were trending in the wrong direction. But to be fair, in the last two years, and you can see it there in the figures here, the trend is trending positively again. So what we are seeing is that river nitrates concentrations and groundwater nitrates concentrations have started uh, trending in, in, a, in, a, in the other direction. And I think that's a lot to do with the actions that farmers have, have taken. And I suppose, in fairness, the, the research and advice in terms of looking at farming in a way that, that, that ensures we protect water quality as much as, as we possibly can. So I think, the, 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 and I think that context is very important to consider when we're looking at the whole policy of where we're going with regard to uh, how we're going to um, uh, look at at achieving the targets that were set now by 2030. So if you put, if you just look at the different measures and you put the hectares together, so you're talking about 68,500 hectares for far, afforestation, 115,000 hectares for anaerobic digestion, 80,000 hectares to be reduced intensity farming. You've got the nitrates, which it could take 28,000 hectares. I hope, I hope it doesn't, but I think it could. Um, and you've got increase in tillage area. So you put them all together like that's, and you say you exclude rough grazing and commonage, 
that's 9% of the land area in the country. So I suppose, and, and again, like when I'm looking at this, uh, the Climate Action Plan, and from our IFA's perspective, like we want to be able to try and achieve this 25%. We want to get the emissions trending in the right direction. And they are, they will this year from 2022 uh, is going to show that. But I think it's just important that we put in context what we're potentially looking at doing here. And are we, is there a coordination? Like, are we thinking about, well, Lulu CF targets would have one impact, uh, other policy changes. So we need to be thinking in, 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 a, in, a, in a, I suppose, in a coherent fashion, looking at the areas uh, um, rather than looking in silos at these. So just to finish, I think one of the things that, and then Liam alluded to it earlier, like there's, you know, when I look at the EU power and policy direction, in my view, I think it's pretty clear food production is, is, uh, is secondary in the thinking in, in, in Europe. Um, and so, and if you look at it, so the latest cap is going to reduce food production because in real terms, the amount of funding coming from Europe into Ireland in Pillar 1 has fallen in real terms by about 20% over the last 15 years. That's a substantial cut. Um, and then you look at the latest around a uh, cap program, like you've got um, reduced funding in real terms, you've got eco schemes, you've got increased non-productive areas, and you've got you've got, in general, where you see the most productive farmers taking the largest cut of their payments. So it's, it's inevitable it's going to impact food production. And hopefully, at some stage, uh, this will resonate. And I know Lee mentioned earlier, there is signs that that is starting to resonate some bit in Europe now. But sir, because there's no doubt that it, that's, that's what's going to happen. And if you look at the other policies that are on the horizon, like, so like as the Nature Restoration Law, Industrial Emissions Directive, um, there's uh, Carbon Farming, and EU taxonomy regulation. I'm not going to go into them in detail today, but I suppose the point is that they all will inhibit rather than promote food production by their design. So, and then the question is, well, where are we going to be at the end of this decade? Um, so I suppose I just wanted to kind of put that in context about what is there in the Climate Action Plan. And again, it's looking at it and saying, well, what can we do here? And how can we, how can we try and achieve the objectives, but also make sure that we don't um, do irreparable harm from a social and economic perspective by blindly pursuing environmental sustainability at the exclusion of everything else. So thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take questions later. Thanks, thanks, Tyke. And I might just um, give you one question before we move on to Lauren's. And I suppose the diversification um, part of your presentation, and it is really a huge chunk of, of the solution essentially, it's nearly a quarter of our target. If you, if you take tillage and anaerobic digestion and more uh, anaerobic digestion and more if you add in the organics, but how can we make those enterprises attractive enough to farmers to make the decision to change their land use, to change their farming practices? I, I think that um, I think the, the, the bottom line is that farmers will rightly, if you look at any of the sectors and you look at if you want to, to uh, change practice, whether it be in transport or be it in energy, whatever, it's, it, it, uh, um, people respond to signals and they respond to, 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 uh, to, I suppose they look at it and they say, well, is this going to make sense for me? So farmers are, are they're obviously going to look at things and say, well, economically, if this makes sense for me, yeah, I'm going to look at it, I'm going to consider it. But I think that we, one of the frustrations, and you know, I would have with, uh, say, I suppose, really the Minister for Environment in particular, I don't want to be trying to cast as versus anyone, but it frustrates me when I see the uh, speaking when in media about, you know, farmers changing and going to this and make them more sustainable the whole lot, when there's, you go, well, well what's the thinking behind it? Because um, if, if we're going to, farmers are not just going to plough into something else um, and take a risk and hope sure it'll be all grand and uh, you know, live horse and eat grass kind of thing. So I think that what we have to see, what farmers will have to see is that economically, this makes sense to them. Because if it doesn't make economic sense to them, if it's not going to be profitable to them, you can't expect a farmer to go and, and, and you know, become, change, look at change in their enterprise or the way they're farming at the moment, and then also look at, well, what's that going to mean uh, in terms of wherever, they're, whether it is they decide to move from dairy to tillage or whatever. It's just they're only going to do this if it economically makes sense for them. And, and I think that that's something that we have to have some sort of analysis on because I mean, Kieran, in his earlier session, 
outline very well the economic value that we're getting from the sector at the moment. Okay, thanks, Tyke. And Lawrence, if I could ask you to come and give your presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Um, so what I want to talk about is talk a little bit about where we are, where our emissions are, and maybe what we can do to reduce emissions uh, going forward. And just maybe to kick it off, I told, uh, Ty texted me before Christmas about doing this, doing this gig, and I was at home with COVID, and I said, sure, that's next year. I don't need to worry about that. Um, so COVID does affect your thinking, just in case anyone doesn't think it is, right? Because <laughs> um, he texted me last week and said, are we ready? And I said, oh, Jesus. Um, so what I want to talk about is improving sustainability and talk a little about where we are and where we want to go. So I, I put up this slide a lot because it just brings us back to what we're trying to do in our production systems. And what we're trying to do is convert something that's inedible, human inedible, into something that's human edible. So that's the objective of all the work we're doing um, as farmers on the ground. And we can't forget about that. So when we look at our numbers, and just, to, you know, most ruminant production systems are TMR-based, <coughs> total mixed ration. They're inside for most of their lives. They're fed high, high concentrate diets. When we compare TMR systems versus grass-based systems, what we can see here is that basically in a TMR system, you just about get out the same level of human digestible protein or human edible protein that then you consume. Whereas in a French, this is a French paper, uh, it was 2.6 to 1. So one kilo of human edible in, 2.6 kilos of human edible out. We're doing this work, and this is dairy data, the exact same data is there for beef. Uh, in, a, in a dairy situation, we put in one kilo of human edible, we get out about four and a half, right? So that gives you the context. And, you know, up to this year, that probably wasn't very important given that, you know, there was loads of, you know, food in, in Europe. But, you know, lots of things have happened in 2022 that have changed the debate. And food security is very important. And we can't forget food security. While it's great to be in a position that, you know, Western society have loads of food and we're all we're worried about is cost, in reality, you know, food security is a concern for lots of people around the world, and we just can't, can't forget that. So pasture-based systems, it's been mentioned in the previous sessions, pasture-based systems are really important in terms of increasing food security. Just, and, and I suppose there is no certainty on, on emissions. As we get new science, and that's what I'm going to really be talking about today, as we get new science, our numbers change. And just to give the context, the carbon footprint of dairy in, uh, run through the Bordbia models, the Chagas models that are run through Bordbia, was coming out at somewhere around 1.1 kilos of CO2 equivalent per kilo of fat and protein corrected milk. When we get more data, uh, which we did over the last couple of years in terms of fertilizer emissions and so on, by just changing those emission factors, which in, in fairness to the EPA are in the EPA and the inventory, our emissions from milk go from 1.1 down to 0.97. And there's lots more of that to come. So we get more information, and, and our numbers change, and that's something that, that's important in, in, in this debate. I'm not going to dwell on this at all. You know, Tig talked about it. 2018, we produced 23 million tonnes. We have to get to 17.25. That's, that's the plan. There is, there is technologies that we have today, and, and Tig talked about them, uh, that we can, we can get immediate effect. And just to say that there is, you know, huge progress being made in 2022, we need to keep that momentum, whether it's protected urea, whether it's lime, whether it's uh, whatever. We need to keep that momentum and take on the technologies that we, that we have. There's new technologies coming, and that's really what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my talk, just give you an idea of where they're at. Some are close, some are further away. But there's some real, real excitement coming in terms of potential solutions that are on the way to maybe bring us to bridge that gap beyond that 16%, 17 uh, to maybe closer to that 25%. So the first one is in terms of emission factors. So, what, you know... Up to very recently, we weren't doing a whole lot of methane measurement, whether it was in beef systems, sheep systems, or dairy systems. Uh, we're doing much more of it now, and that's going to be ramped up further and further and further. And basically, you know, to be fair to the, you know, the EPA have their inventory models. We work, we ultimately developed some of those inventory models, uh, and we feed science into the EPA through the inventory process. And as that science gets published and it's robust, then it gets updated and you have new numbers. So, you know, currently we have a figure that uh, when a cow eats feed, uh, about 6.5% of that is lost, of that energy is lost as, as methane. As we collect more data, we're, getting, we're changing figures on that. Same with Jan in terms of when they're indoor and silage, we're using an equation. And these, this, this data is pretty old. Just to give you a kind of a picture of what we're finding. So, so we have data that's old. What we're finding is that when we measure methane, um, it's substantially lower. In our, in our grazing, dairy, it's a grazing dairy cow system, when we measure that methane, uh, it's substantially below what the models are saying. So 
That means we have new science and it's going through the peer review process. Now, that new science is going to feed into the inventory and it's it, you know, it, it, it highly possible that we'll have new emissions. So instead of a dairy cow producing a certain amount of emissions, they'll be producing a substantial amount less. So basically, when we pull all that together, um, we're saying that you know, we are overestimating the methane in our, in our models by quite a significant amount, maybe 10, 12 percent, in, in, uh, when cows are at grazing. So the numbers here aren't, aren't important. It's just to paint the picture of, 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 um, of, of what we're doing. Secondly, when indoor animals are indoor in silage, we're currently using a model that came from Northern Ireland, data is significant, maybe 20 years old. When we measure animals indoors, uh, uh, you know, in terms of methane, we're coming up with substantially lower numbers. So again, as that science gets published, that will go into the inventory uh, and change those, those inventory numbers. So just to give you, and I've called this baseline, because, and, and the reason why I'm saying that is that when we update these emission factors, we update back what happened in 2018. So, so that's important. Um, so, you know, the emission factors for grazing and silage, that's been done in a dairy system. It's also been done in beef systems, and it's been done, um, it's going to be started in sheep systems. So there is substan potentially substantial wins we know on the dairy side and potentially on the beef uh, and sheep sides as well, both indoor and grazing. In terms of another update that's, that's, that has happened and the models are being uh, looked at is in terms of beef model updates. So essentially how the models uh, take new emission factors, how they link to ICBF, I see Andrew Crammy there, how they link to ICBF data uh, to give actual data around um, age of slaughter. Because Tyg mentioned that age of slaughter has reduced quite dramatically in the last 10 years uh, and making sure that the models are picking up that data. Uh, and then the other one there is emission factors. So, you know, there's lots of work going on in Chagas, in Johnstone Castle, on emission factors around different types of fertilizers, on lime, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So to put all that in context, by updating those numbers, it's highly possible that instead of in 2018, we produce in 23 million tons, it's highly possible that that's well under 21 million tons. So, you know, that's something that is, is exciting. As we get more information, we're able to understand better. So what would that mean for the carbon footprint? And again, just to give it a context, in terms of carbon footprint of dairy, instead of it being 108 that we had two years ago, suddenly your carbon footprint, without you doing anything at farm level, by having better information, having more robust information, your carbon footprint drops to 0.87. So again, you know, back to Deirdre and Borbia and marketing, you know, that's hugely important in terms of as we sell in, a, in, a, in an international market in terms of our, our carbon footprint. So I'm just going to talk in a bit, little bit about a couple of technologies that might deliver um, some of the solutions. And there's been lots of talk about additives. You know, there was one, I think, again, in the, in the, in the, in, probably in the journal last week around uh, an additive that can give us 70% reduction in methane uh, based on work that's coming from New Zealand. And again, there's lots of excitement uh, around that. Just to caution, most of the additives have lots of claims. When you test them, they give you very little, right? So that's, that's, that's. And maybe that's a lot about a lot of the stuff that we, we, we have. But there are some that are really are delivering and really are de delivering significant solutions. So for me, what must an additive have? It must have consistent methane reduction, right? It must have a mechanism delivery. And, and, and it just be surprise you about some of the groups that have additives developed and they haven't thought about how you're going to get it into the animal. Uh, it must be able to be counted in the inventory. So there's no point in using this thing and paying lots of money if you're not going to get credit for it. It's a waste of time. So it has to be counted in the inventory. There, need, there can be no food safety or, or, or uh, residue impact and no, egg, no, no negative uh, performance effects, right? So they're non-negotiable. What's desirable? That they're low cost. So we, we're, in, you know, we're in a situation where we, we don't have solutions, so we can't actually sell someone, oh, yeah, I want you to give us that, that solution, and then we say, I want you to give it to us for free or for cheap or whatever. So, so, so you know, that's probably a, a desirable, and I think as, as we have more additives, that, that, that will happen. Increased performance benefits would be nice. Uh, natural origin would be nice, again, in the marketing side. And the potential to combine with other solutions would also be nice in terms of the additive. So just to give you context, the detail here, not important, just to give you a picture of some of the work that we have done and some of the work that's, that's coming out there now. So just to say that, you know, that, that, that is a study that lasted um, about 10 weeks. The blue line is the methane. So that's the methane that the animals are producing. So somewhere around 300 uh, grams a day, hovering up and down. When we put in the additive at 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, methane dropped for about two and a half hours, uh, dropped by about 40-45%, went back up again. Right? Same in the evening. These are this correspondent to milking times. So as the animals uh, were fed the additive, um, the, the methane dropped. So what do we hear? We now know we have an additive that works. It reduces methane. 
What we don't have is an additive that lasts long enough in the rumen to give us a very strong, long effect. So, so that's the next piece of work there. But just giving you a picture, you know, we're getting a 46% reduction uh, you know, in, the, in the immediate effect, and, and it, it, it leaves the room, and the effect drops pretty quickly. So what do we need now? So that means we have an additive that works. Now the next step is, can we get a way of slow releasing that, that we can extend that effect for longer, uh, whether that's a bolus, whether that's uh, protected in a feed. So that's where the research will follow now to try and get the effect. So to keep the effect for longer and get a bigger effect over time. This is one we're doing today. So this is a study that's about four weeks old. It's very live data. Um, obviously, when it's live data, it could change again. But just to highlight in terms of it's a TMR study in, in, in Johnstown Castle with a winter milk herd, just to give you a picture, um, the methane... Uh, Per day is coming out at 431. There's high, you know, relatively high milk yield cows, 30, 30 kilos, um, 2.4 kilos of milk solids per day. They're getting about 430 kilos of methane per day in the control. Uh, in the treatment is 337, so roughly a 25, 22 to 25 percent reduction uh, in methane. This was done in beef cattle last year, and there was a 30 percent reduction uh, in, with that additive. So we have an additive that works in uh, 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 an indoor setting. We need it to work in, 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 a, in a grazing setting. <coughs> Next one is genetics. Um, and, and just to say that the EBI uh, is reducing the greenhouse gas footprint. So we have here is, um, if we look at our elite animals, so our high production, high elite, high EBI animals, uh, data carbon footprint of 0.96 kilos of CO2 equivalent per kilo of fat and protein protected milk. Our national average animals were at 106. So essentially, higher EBI animals have a lower carbon footprint. Unfortunately, our high EB animals have the same methane output overall. So if we look at the top line there, the methane, or sorry, greenhouse gas output, uh, you know, they're the same, 16.2, 16.3. So what EBI is doing is it's increasing the efficiency of what we're doing, but it's not reducing the overall emissions. And what Tyg talked about and what the debate, of, you know, about the greenhouse gases is overall emissions and not emissions intensity. It's very positive that the EBI is reducing the emissions intensity, but we also need to be able to reduce the overall emissions. And that was until work we did last year where we looked again at dairy cows uh, and we looked at our high BI, our really uh, highly bred animals versus our national average animals and we compared methane output per day and we've basically found no difference. So our methane output per day for our elite versus our national average are the same, even though the milk solids output for the uh, elite was about 10% uh, higher. So essentially, uh, we have animals that are producing more milk but they're not producing more methane. And our models don't know that. We've never told the models that. So the models assume that once uh, milk yield goes up, methane goes up, right? So, so now we think that there's something here pretty big from a genetics point of view that we hadn't factored in before or hasn't been in any of the calculations. So if we look at our model, it would tell us that the calculated methane for the elite animals is more because they're producing more milk. When in effect, we know that there's no, 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 no difference. So this is something that we, we actually only knew, we only found out in the last year uh, we have two years' data now, and it's tell us uh, a very similar, similar result. So what does all that mean? It means that, from a genetic point of view, there is potentially something we can get into the inventory um, that's not just efficiency-based, but it's also reducing the overall emissions. So that's something that is, is really important, and it's something that you, that, you know, dairy farmers, beef farmers, in terms of breeding, are breeding on a constant basis. Uh, if we can follow this and pick it up on the beef side as well, then we're into a really strong picture that we had actually a mitigation that we actually never even knew about. Uh, and that's something that, that's going to be a strong focus of our work, uh, ICBF work, uh, as we go uh, into the future. And just the last point on genetics is the carbon sub-index, um, which is a new sub-index in the EBI that was launched in 2022. It'll be in the index for 2023. Not loved by everyone, I think we, we, it's, it's fair to say, but it is, uh, I suppose, an attempt... Um, to start to bring emissions into the, uh, as we breed animals and bring that into the uh, overall, overall uh, calculations. The final one on mitigation is manure management. And I think manure management is something that we haven't, probably there's, there's, there's work, certain amounts of work going on in, 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 in Chagas, but I think it's one that we can ramp up much more. Like if you think about it, we have 6.5 million animals, ruminants in the uh, bovines in the, in the, in the country, we have a lot less slurry tanks. So like being able to treat a slurry tank to reduce methane 
might be a lot easier than reducing individual animals. And there's some really positive early research showing, you know, whether it's alum or ferric chloride or acetic acid, um, that's showing significant reductions in methane for methane and storage. And just to be put in context, methane in storage is roughly about 1.8 million tonnes of our overall um, uh, emissions of that 23 million tonnes. So it's a huge number. Um, maybe we can make significant progress with that. I suppose it, one point to say is a lot of the, the, the solutions are pH-based. You're dropping the pH. Is there, you know, I think we need to be clear that is that going to have an impact on slurry storage structural integrity, all that has to be built in, health and safety. Uh, but there is cer certainly a significant area of work, and I think there's huge potential here um, that we haven't really factored into our numbers. <coughs> the last piece I want to talk about is post-2030. You're probably saying to yourself, why is he talking about post-2030 now? We're, like, in 2023. Well, it's important because that debate around 2030 has started already, right? So what do we look like at 2030? And, and Mary mentioned that the Paris Accord and, and temperature stabilisation, uh, one and a half degrees, uh, you know, not letting it, you know, one and a half degrees. So, the, you know, what can agriculture do? So the policy is, 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 very, is set until 2030. What's policy going to look like after, after that? Because, uh, you know, the, the objectives are going, to be, are going to be different. So beyond 2030, how do we, um, you know, achieve temperature stabilization? And for me, this is something the agri-food industry needs to embrace rather than the policy. I think the policy will come second. It will come afterwards. So what does climate neutrality mean? For me, it's about no additional warming. So can agriculture be in a situation by maybe mid-2035 where it's not increasing temperature? That would be a massive, massive claim to make. Um, it's not doing anything about the historic warming, but it's not increasing temperature. I think that would be a very positive space to be. So the first one is biogenic methane. What do we need to do there? And I'm not going to go into the detail here. You know, there's different calculations, and, and Peter is much, much, much more qualified to talk about that than me. But just to say that using a, a different calculation, um, basically, if we reduce methane by about 10% by 2040, it's about 8.5% to 9% percent by 2040, and 3.5% per decade after that, we can have zero, warm, zero additional warming for methane. It's very important that we keep the word additional. Zero additional warming for methane. So imagine if agriculture could claim to be in a position to say it's not increasing warming. That's, where we, that's the objective we need to have to get ahead uh, of, 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 of you know, where the rest of society will be because the you know, rest of society, I think, will struggle to get to this space. Does all this stuff, is it all made up? Is it, you know, does that methodology or the GWP star methodology, is that pie in the sky? And again, uh, the IPCC basically, and, and what's highlighted here is, is important because, you know, sometimes we read these documents. This one, I think, is, is for, you know, three and a half thousand pages. Peter, you've been involved in writing some of these, so, like, you're much better qualified to, 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 to do this. But just when you read the text here, you know, GWP star... Uh, the warming evolution resulting from net zero using GWP, defined in this way, corresponds approximately to reaching net zero CO2 emissions. You know, what does that mean? But anyway, and, and would this does not lead to declining temperatures? So you won't decline temperatures. So that's, that's important. Um, after net zero emissions are achieved, but to an approximate temperature stabilization. And that high confidence part is, is important here. So, so you know, a 10% reduction in methane between now and 2040, and all methane warming, additional warming, is gone. The Climate Change Council, this is a report that came, and again, Peter, you're involved in this, um, just in terms of some of the work that Paul Price did, and basically, just to say that it, it kind of accepts the, the methodology in terms of the warming, warming effect. Nitrous oxide, I'm not going to deal with this because I'm quite tight on time and I'm nearly finished now, Mary, just to, just to say. Um, nitrous oxide, we produce about 5.7 million tonnes of nitrous oxide between the reduction in chemical nitrogen, between uh, protected urea, and probably some new emission factors, potentially that can be got to 4 million tonnes in the next you know, um, period of time. So, so now we have methane taken out, so there's no more warming associated with methane. Now we have nitrous oxide gone from 5.7 down to 4 with action at farm level. So we have 4 million tonnes. So like we're in a much better place in terms of warming. So the last piece then is carbon dioxide. And this is probably a lot of you know, controversial for a lot of farmers in terms of, of what's happening. So just to be clear, what are the numbers saying? In the national inventory, we assume that, that and that's tier one, so, so essentially it means it's international default value, mineral soils sequester about a half a ton of CO2 equivalent. So that's, you know, that's great. You'd say, right, very positive, very positive. That's good. Soils are sequesters by 3.9 million hectares, so that's about 2 million tons. Unfortunately, drained peat soils are assumed to lose 25 tons, and these are ballpark figures. 
across 335,000 hectares. So that's closer to 8.5 million tonnes, right? So we're losing 8.5 million tonnes, we're gaining 2 million tonnes. So the net picture is about 6.4 million tonnes. What do we not know? And just to put it in person, what do we not know? Sequestration on mineral soils, we think, is underestimated at 0.5 a tonne CO2 equivalent. We think that might be closer to 1.5 or 2. We don't know, but it is a lot. It's a lot higher than 0.5. Um, so just to put it in context, if it was 1.5, um, or, you know, if it was 1.5, so you'd be talking about 6 million tonnes rather than 2 million tonnes of, of, of uh, carbon being sequestered. Drainage status of peat soils, we have absolutely no idea. And, you know, I'm from North Clare. I see actually a lot of North Clare people here, which is very positive. If we look at the drainage status of peat soils, you know, I think a lot of these soils that were drained in the last 50 years are, are, no, longer, are no longer drained. So that's, that's important. We don't know how much carbon has been lost from these, from these uh, peat soils. So the net picture, excluding forestry, actually might be a positive. Instead of losing carbon, the soils might actually be gaining carbon. So could, we could be in a very, very positive place from a carbon point of view. So if we just paint a picture, methane gone to zero by reducing by 10% from additional warming. Nitrous oxide, you know, we need to reduce it significantly. Maybe we can get it down to 4 million tonnes. If, if, we, if we have more accurate uh, emission factors for our soils, can we get that up dramatically and be in a, in a net position of net zero? So that, you know, climate stabilisation might be very possible by mid-35s. This is a French paper that was published this year. just shows the kind of range across Europe in terms of uh, sequestration on different soils. And you can see here there's a huge range. And this is carbon. So to make this into CO2 equivalent, you multiply it by 3.6. So this first one there, improved grazing. There was sequestering about 1.2 tonnes per hectare. Um, you know, your fertilised um, your fertilised um, sward was sequestering roughly about 2.1, 2.2. So there is huge potential here in terms of our soils uh, once we have more accurate information. The final piece on that is that there is lots of information being collected um, on this now. Uh, you could say maybe we're slow to the race, and, and DAFM have funded huge amounts of this. Uh, SFI, Vista Milk, Dairy Levy. Uh, you know, there's lots of funding, and this investment is going in pretty, pretty strongly now. And, and, you know, Bill might comment, but I think we have one of the densest network now of eddy covariance towers anywhere in the world. So, so this information will become available, uh, and it's, it'll, you know, it, it'll take some time, but it will be robust information. Final slide, progress at farm level. So if we just look at our National Farm Survey and we look at what's happening, you can see that, you know, the amount of protected urea, dramatically increased, Tig, Tig talked about it. The amount of less is increasing. Um, the percentage of slurry supply, uh, applied as less is increasing uh, on dairy farms. Um, <coughs> the percentage of chemical as protected urea, et cetera. So there is progress. Finally, you know, if we look at lime usage, it's up by 49%. I think uh, the president mentioned that at the start. It's up by 49% in 22 versus 21. Protected urea is up by 59%. And less, 48% of slurry is spread by less in 2022 versus 4% in 18. So there is progress being made at farm level, and you as farmers are taking on the technologies that are there. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Lawrence. A huge amount covered there. And I suppose just one of the quick questions before we open it to the panel is, I suppose the exciting research that you mentioned there in that higher output or higher yielding cows are not necessarily higher methane emitters, when will that translate into our inventory? When will, when, when will that make a difference? What's the time frame? So, so and, and, and Mary Francis, you might comment on this after. Uh, the process is, is quite simple. You know, we, we may be sometimes overcomplicated, Mary. Once there's scientific papers, once it's peer reviewed, so the peer review process is essentially you write a paper, it gets sent off uh, to a journal. The journal then have, you know, send it to other, other, other maybe authors to read it. They come back with their comments. So you have a peer-reviewed process. So generally, if you have a number of papers that are showing a similar trend, well, that's something then that's, that's taken up by the EPA. So there is, there's probably no magic to it. It's just we need to get the science. We need to have it robust. It needs to be published. And then it can be brought into the, to the inventory. And I suppose we'll move on to you, Mary Francis. Like, how does this scientific research make it to the EPA inventory? So um, the, the other thing that, that I'd, I'd add to, to Lawrence's comment there is that in addition to it being a finding through a research setting, what we need to see then is that it is um, applicable. It's been at, a, at either a national level or at a, a sub-herd level that the information is consistent with that as well. So 
um, that, that you're, you're moving beyond kind of the, the perfect scenario that, that you have in a research setting to make sure that it's applicable at a, a regular farm level situation as well. So all of that gets factored in in relation to the, the inventories and projections. And if I was just to, to maybe take a, a step back a bit in, in relation to the inventories and, and, and what they are. So the, the EPA has a, a role nationally in the compilation of what are known as the greenhouse gas inventories and projections. And essentially, they're the set of accounts when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions from Ireland. The inventories look back in, in terms of the, the previous year and the projections look forward. And in the compilation of those inventories, the EPA works with a number of stakeholders. So we're taking, in the production of, of that set of inventories, we are producing the inventories across the whole economy. And in the case of the agricultural inventories, we are working with Chagas, the Department of Agriculture, the CSO would be the, the largest sources of information for, the, for, for that data. And we're looking at all the sources of, infor, of, of what are, are, are referred to in, in the inventory as the activity data. So we're looking at the amount of fertilizer, the type of fertilizer, the type of application, we're looking at the type of animals, um, and we're looking at that in quite granular level detail. We follow the methodologies that are set out at an international level because these set of accounts are used for Ireland's reporting at an EU and a UN level, and then also in terms of the national picture as well, and, and that's what, what TIG outlined in, in relation to our carbon budgets, our, our, our climate um, legislation as well, to, to see how is Ireland doing in relation to that. So it's pulling together all that level of information. As I said, there's a standard in order to, to do this that's set at an international level. Um, so there are, um, and, the, and, and then the EPA, Ireland, is audited in relation to how we do that as well. So we need to be really consistent in terms of how we pull these accounts together. Um, and when we look then at how is the research coming through into the inventory, well, we need to make sure that when Ireland is audited, that how we've brought that research in and um, how we've applied those figures stands up to, to scrutiny as well. And the EPA has quite a lot of experience in relation to, to that, both in terms of being um, auditors ourselves. So many of the team go internationally and, and audit other people's accounts, uh, other countries' inventories and projections. And then, you know, so, so we come from a good place in terms of, of being able to bring that data in. But really, we need the, the research to, to come through. We need to make sure then that it's applicable at a, at a farm level as well. Okay, so say I'm Mary Farmer, I'm using low emission slurry spreading, I've added some clover to a number of my pastures, I'm, I've reduced the age of slaughter on average for by a month and a half, and um, I'm using protected urea, and I've shifted to 50% protected urea. Does it make a difference? Like, where, where is that going to show? Yeah, so um, there's a number of, of things that, that are going on there and many of you will have heard of this, these ideas of direct, um, of, of measures that are seen directly within the inventory and then other measures that are called these enablers uh, is the, the terminology that, that we're using. So um, if you are, if you've reduced your um, amount of, of fertilizer that you've spread on, on your farm, then we'll see that coming through at a national level in relation to the amount of fertilizer. So we'll, we'll see the fertilizer sales levels and, and we, we'll see that reduction there. If you've sown um, multi-species or clover in, in, in a bid to, um, with the intention of reducing your um, fertilizer use on, on, on farm, but you haven't reduced the, the you, you've continued to, to um, use the same amount of fertilizer, then you're not going to see a reduction in overall emissions from fertilizer usage on farm. And again, like one of the things that, that we're identifying and, and Lawrence highlighted, that lime usage, for example, is increasing. And that's really important in relation to, to soil fertility, and it's a real positive given the the historic deficit that, that we've had there. But 
for example, looking into the future, if we see that um, lime usage is increasing, but fertiliser usage isn't going down, then we're not going to see a reduction in our overall emissions. So it's, it's that balance there. You might have had another scenario in, in, in what you outlined there, Mary, that I might the have missed. The protected urea. The protected urea as well. So we'll see. So um, one of the, the things that, again, people are, are often concerned about is, you know, are, are we kind of applying this book value or a standard emission factor when it comes to, to, to the various activities? And what we have over the, going back now, back in, I think it's about 2016, Lauren, you'll correct me, is that we, we've identified the various emission factors that are associated with each type of fertiliser. So there's a different emission factor if you're applying CAN, straight urea, protected urea, you know, so that will absolutely come through in relation to, to the inventories. And also then looking forward into the projections. So we'll be able to see that you know, the, the measures that TIG outlined that, you know, as a sector, if we're saying, you know, the sector is going to reduce the amount of um, or move towards protected urea um, up, up to, to high 90 percent, then we know we can project then what impact that will have in relation to emissions reduction. OK, I so to summarise what you're saying is that any action at farm level, you know, will be counted in our final number. So it does make a difference. Every action does make a difference. And, mm -hmm. and it is accounted for, um, as you said, the granular level. And then the emerging technologies that Lauren spoke about, I mean, your liaison, when the science research is there and it's published, that if it's, if it's recognised that it's, it can be applicable at a wider scale, it too will count. So I suppose there's very positive information coming from that. Absolutely. And I, I guess the, 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 the point to flag here is that um, as a sector, um, there is greater um, clarity and um, specificity around how the sector will implement the measures that are associated with nitrogen use. Um, and so there, there's a clearer path in relation to how that's going to happen. The, the methane and, um, aspect of the, the reductions has been less clear, and, and that's you know, quite clear when, when you look at the, the research is still coming through in relation to that. And one of the, the key messages that the EPA had last year when we produced our projections was the need to have a clear time frame, specific detail in relation to how the methane emissions we're, we're going to, to methane emission reductions were going to be achieved, and, and that's a piece of information that that is needed when we when we start looking forward in terms of identifying how the targets are going to be met. Okay, thanks. And I'm Bill Callan, and Chief Inspector with the Department of Agriculture. If I could come to you. Um, the Antisha Leo Vragkar was recently quoted in the Farmers Journal as saying we are putting in place incentives to diversify and farmers need a very attractive scheme to make the decision. What does that look like or where are we on that? I suppose I'd reverse it back a little bit though in terms of kind of from me listening to everything I'd heard and I suppose trying to bridge science and policy. Um, I think what I've heard today and it's very positive and I think the um, the president put it very well this morning in terms of farmers are up to it, but they want to have an honest discussion and honesty in terms of that engagement. I think that was reflected uh, in the Taoiseach's comments. Um, we have a very good story to tell in terms of food production in this country. Right? That's the reality of it. If you look at our, any metrics that you use, whether it's water quality, we're in the top third in Europe. Similarly, grass-fed, uh, rain-fed system of um, livestock production is very environmentally friendly. Um, and we have a very diverse biodiversity platform. But I have to be honest with people as well in terms of the criticism that we're getting externally is that some of those metrics and some of that narrative is in a negative trend. And I think we have to recognize that and say, well, look at how do we address that as a mechanism of supporting that food systems approach that, that we want to deliver out of it. And what do I mean by that? If you look at water quality, it has declined in recent years. Uh, if you look at from a climate perspective, our land use, notwithstanding the work in terms of uh, uh, Lawrence is doing and the measurement of that is a net emitter so it's not contributing to removing emissions and if you look at it, the EU point of view that Lame was talking about a climate neutral Europe in 2050 really has only two options in terms of pulling out that residual emissions that are associated with the likes of aviation and that's carbon capture and storage or how we use our land 
So they're increasingly a focus on that. So I think there has to be an honesty of look at the positives that we have, but also reflecting how do we change the negative. For me, then, in terms of how you deal with that, what keeps me awake at night is understanding, well, look at how we the building blocks to do that. And being honest with people in terms of that, and that is ensuring we have the research. And I think we're in a good place overall in terms of that investment to know what's possible. But relying on future solutions won't address the problems of today, and I think we have to reflect on that. Have we a plan? Well, we were the first sector that came out with a plan in terms of achieving the 2019 target, Ag Climatise. And we will build on that again in terms of engagement with farmers. The um, dairy vision groups is another example of engaging with farmers around what can we do. The Chagas Macorv identifies those actions and that uh, we embrace the implementation of those. It's not going to be easy. I'm not going to say to anybody it's not going to, uh, that it's easy. It's not. There's no silver bullet. It's a whole series of changes at individual farm level. As Mary said, then when you put into the infantry, make a difference. Looking at have we the structure in terms of advisory support for farmers? You know, have we, uh, as I'm sure Frank and him in the audience will talk about the likes of the signpost farms, are the messages to farmers consistent? Because farmers are doers, and, and once they understand, we'll say, listen, tell me what I need to do. It's critical to that conversation. Uh, have we the policies that are supporting that? Uh, that's so, for example, you know, working with industry around having understandable metrics understandable actions that we know can translate and change the inventory in terms of our emissions and, and creating that into the story around Irish food production. Because to my mind, there's a very simple hierarchy of food production. In the first instance, you know, if you're hungry, don't pretty much give a shit about anything else. It's food availability is your first concern. That's the reality of it, and it's a worldwide issue, not just an Irish issue. You know, we've seen countries, let's say, where food shortage is a constant problem. There's 800 people going to bed every night hungry. It's not right. Second stage then of that is safety. Is it safe? And everybody has known about the outbreaks like some uh, melanin in China. You know, is our system safe? And we have a very strong record in that. The next one is it sustainable. That's what people get exercised about. And I believe the next one above that will be health. The next generation considering how food improves their health. Are we aligning with that? And this isn't just government driven. It's driven by the consumer and we have to maintain our relevance, and that's around having a verifiable piece. Um, the last thing I do think into the future then, being open in terms of alternatives that are coming from farmland, so whether it's the likes of carbon farming, how do we focus on developing an opportunity to farmers, but conscious that our, our land is, is a net emitter at the moment, uh, but working on how to, I suppose, farm in a way that allows carbon to be captured, uh, etc. Energy production. Like if you're dependent on fossil fuels, they're coming out of the ground, you're looking at renewables, you know, things are going to have to change in terms of that. How does the likes of biomethane support it? And are we open to that? So I'll just give a practical example. Like when I was a young lad 30 years ago, I worked on a, a farm in Tullerone as part of my practical year. And at that time, he was one of the most innovative farmers feeding young bulls. And one of the key feeds at that time was whey. He was very cheap very high in energy, going into feed bulls, put a fat cover on them, great stuff altogether, turbo fuel. And now you have a company who's actually creating value out of that to the uh, health market internationally at a much better value than it is in terms of feeding young bulls. So we have to be open to looking at alternative opportunities for farmers in terms of those that are going to be created by society, societal demands in terms of energy, yeah. building materials, all those sort of things. So... Okay, so I suppose, and, and to summarise, I suppose it's, it's recognised that support is needed, you know, farmers, this, they need the support on the ground to adopt the core measures, but also this diversification or this requirement to change some of the land that's in use currently under livestock farming, maybe to some other enterprises, but is there financial incentives to do so, or have we any visibility on that? So if you look at existing, and, and this will have to evolve as time, but if you look at, like, for example, forestry, there's been a very, very major injection in terms of finance. It's now a 1.3 billion euro program. Uh, if you look at the development of organics, as a good example, um, that has moved from a situation of being very niche to now having had a, a scheme launch recently where there's up against 2,000 people have applied. Like, so we're going to be at 4,000 organic farmers quite quickly. You look at the development of tillage, you know, on a government level, and I 
responsible for the utility sector for quite some time, you know, you have the likes of the utility incentive scheme. We have the strong corporation scheme now that are all focused on, I suppose, you know, government can't run the wheel, but it can grease it in terms of a certain direction and support farmers in that evolution. But it's not just going to be about government. The marketplace will have to reward this as well, and that's critical. And we're seeing increasingly companies as well. So, for example, um, uh, a major drinks company supporting farmers through a, a, a reward for sustainability actions on their farm, regenerative farming, they call it. We have the same with a number of dairy processors. That has to be part of the conversation. You know, and farmers can't be carrying the cost for sustainability for everybody. It has to be a fair conversation but a recognition that it's not always going to be government support. There has to be industry support. Are we aligning the same messages that translate into inventory that Mary needs between what farmers are doing as asked by government and farmers are doing as asked by their processors or, or uh, co-ops? Okay, thanks, Bill. And Professor Peter Thorne, I'll go to you. So we've heard an awful lot about the core measures, the emerging science that's coming on board. But why is it so important that agriculture achieves its 2030 target to begin with? So, uh, well, first thing to say is that farmers are at the forefront of climate change. Climate change is already a problem today. Many of you will have struggled with the heat waves this last summer. Uh, many will, of you will have been affected by numerous floods that have occurred. This is climate change. This is here and now. This is the result of our historical behavior as a society, principally through the burning of fossil fuels for nearly two centuries. And so we need to act. We know that climate change now is a challenge to all of society, I would argue particularly to the farming sector. We know what 1.2 degrees today's global warming looks like. If we don't continue to act, we know the science is crystal clear that things will get worse. The challenges will get worse. The heat waves will become more frequent, more severe. The extreme precipitation events will get more extreme, more, more frequent. <coughs> We will not stop this getting worse unless and until we reach net zero. Now, net zero is broader than the agricultural sector. The agricultural sector could get to net zero and we would not be net zero as a country. It requires all of society. And one of the things that drives me absolutely potty is any time climate change action comes up in the media by the third question, it's agriculture. That fundamentally means that it makes it to 98% of the population who are not farmers, to quote the late, great Douglas Adams, somebody else's problem. It is not somebody else's problem. It is all of our problems. Agriculture must play its part, but agriculture alone cannot solve this. And agriculture playing its part means, yes, meeting the challenge of getting us to 25% by 2030, meeting the challenge of getting us to net zero by 2050. As numerous people have said, this will not be simple. But the alternative is that we do not stabilize climate, that climate continues to get worse, that the farms we leave to future generations become less and less viable, less and less secure. I do not believe there is a single person in this room who actively wants to do anything other than leave their farm to the next generation in at least as good a shape as they found it themselves. And so it's hugely challenging. It's going to be a huge, huge issue for the sector. It's going to be a huge issue, to be frank, for every sector in society. If I walked into a similar room for any other sector, Many of them are further behind, as others have noted. They'd all be saying the same thing. We can't possibly, we can't possibly. We have no fundamental choice here unless we want this, this challenge to get worse. So we must address it. Okay, and I just want to pick up on something that Lauren said, and he talked about no additional warming when we look at 2030 and beyond. What, what is that for you in terms of agriculture? You know, is that climate neutrality... What, what, what does that mean from your perspective? It, it could look multiple different ways. And that's one of the things. It's, there's no single pathway here. There are multiple potential pathways. And partly it will depend upon, upon how we do accounting internationally. 
and you, you saw in the presentation the GWP star GWP 100 thing. Right now, we emit so much that from an international perspective, nobody cares. I mean, the fundamental challenge here is that the greenhouse gases, there are different greenhouse gases that vary over several thousands orders of magnitude in terms of the radiative effect of an individual molecule and over similar time scales from one year to or less than a year to thousands and tens of thousands of years lifetime in the atmosphere. And policymakers need some way of making equivalents, and they've alighted on this GWP100. And that's fine when we're burning so much fossil fuel and putting so much into the atmosphere, but as we reach net zero, we will have to grapple with the fact that there are greenhouse gases like methane that do not hang around a lot. It's a bit like having a bath and turning the tap on and leaving the plug out. How high it gets depends upon the flow rate in. Whereas there are other greenhouse gases, most notably carbon dioxide, that are the equivalent of just putting the plug in. Until you turn the tap off, it continues to rise. Right now, GWP100 kind of smudges between the two and fudges a lot. As we get towards net zero and climate neutrality, we are going to have to start grappling with the fact that short-lived climate forces have a different imprint than long-lived long climate forces. GWP star as a metric is starting to get there. But unfortunately, EU international accounting is stuck in GWP star at 100. And to give you an idea of how long this might take, they recently, in 2021, said, fantastic, we've updated the GWP100 values to the IPCC AR5 values, six months after AR6 had come out, and fully seven and a half years after IPCC AR5. So getting things moving internationally will take time, but we need to do it that way if we started doing our emissions inventories in a different way to international and EU accounting, we'd get in a hell of a mess. But it's an argument that's being made, uh, not just by the farming community, by the science community. And as we get to net, towards net zero, it's really going to matter. Okay, so Lawrence, I might ask you just to come in very briefly there, because um, Peter talked about methane, which is one of the biggest contributors to our overall emissions, being a short-life climate pollutant. And like that's, that's a key message in terms of, of agriculture. So what, can you just comment on that and, and what we need to do? And, and I suppose what it, you, know, you could look at it and say that you know, methane has a very high warming effect, but it's short-lived. So you know, it's very forgiving is a way of looking at it. So we do something to reduce methane and we can have that effect out of, in a very quick time, 10, 12 years relative to CO2 that's there for thousands of years. Uh, and, and that's really important in, in, in this debate. So it's, it's almost a very forgiving gas. And there has been a debate that, you know, we should focus on the short-lived gas because we'll get an immediate response. But, but actually, you know, the longer-lived gases are going to be there for thousands and thousands of years. So the more we can reduce them, actually, the, the bigger effect. But what Peter's saying from, from a climate point of view is really positive in terms of looking at... Uh, one thing is policy, though. So policy is going to take time, and that's, that's clear. It, it, but for an industry to embrace uh, being climate you know, new, neutral in terms of no additional warming, that's something that the industry doesn't need policy to do. It can do that itself. So as a, as a group of farmers, as an industry together, that's something that we don't need policy to, to lead on. The industry can lead on. The policy might come after. Okay, thanks. So obviously we're well, well over time, but we probably have time for one or two questions. So if anyone has any questions, please put up your hand and just say your name and who the question is for. So I don't know if we have any mics. Yeah. <coughs> Actually, I'll take three questions together, just in the interest of time. So go on ahead. Yeah, John Jeffrey, uh, chairman of the Grain Committee, uh, Cox Central. Uh, how can Professor uh, Thorne say that we're net emitters when there's no work being done on the sequestration? We think there's two tonnes being taken out by our... as much as two tonnes being taken out by our soils. How about the eight tonnes of dry matter that's produced per acre per year Dry matter would be 80 or 90 percent carbon. That's, that's six tons plus two tons in the soil. That's eight tons for every acre. In, uh, well, for the dairy acres and the beef acres, the ones that aren't ploughed. Like you're saying, people are better off in tillage. If you plough, uh, work in Australia tells us that uh, the carbon in the soil, if you're grazing it, increases and doubles every 10 years. If you plough that soil, 
you're releasing that carbon over the soil. So how can you tell us that tillage is better than grazing? Like, wilding now is the great thing all over the world. And they've taken out all the animals uh, out of these wild areas. What happens? Scrub grows up, you get a dry year, the whole place goes on fire. So now they're putting the grazing animals back in. It also promotes the flowers. It happened here with the burn. <coughs> Took the animals off, all the flowers that they were trying to protect were smothered. And they had to go back to the farmers and beg them to put the cattle back up. A lot of those farmers were gone out of business. They were gone to England or somewhere to... So half the burner was covered in hazel bushes. You know? Uh, yeah. Like, okay. And right. uh, where was Mr... Um, um, uh, the first man there on the first session, uh, the first speaker. Where was he the last three years? He, like, he should have been PRO at the IFA and he should have been on the radio at morning, noon and okay, night. Okay, all right. You know? Listen, um, I'll wait, we'll take two more. <laughs> Here and you must send on your agent. Um, but we'll take um, the we'll take two questions together and then we'll go to the panel just to address the, the issues raised. Where? Yeah, go on ahead. Uh, uh, hello, James Gagan, Westmead IFA. Uh, just a couple of points there. One, the total carbon figure for agriculture is there, 23 million ton. Now I learned in school a thing called a carbon cycle, and carbon up and carbon down. That figure is the total for carbon going up and zero taken off for carbon going down. So to me, that figure is totally false. Now, it's great to see Chagas coming up with figures starting, starting to lower that figure, but they have a long way to go, because actually, I think if, if the science, if we go back to science, that figure is already almost neutral. And that 23 million is away with the fairies, because it is zero for what's requested of it. <coughs> now, one of the cures that the government have come up with is to reduce the age of hilly cattle to 20 months. And our lady from Borbia said that our green grass image is our main selling factor worldwide. Now, if we go to a 20-month or 24-month killing of cattle, the majority of our calves are born in January, February, March, April. So their 24-month tw birthday is January, February, March, April. Now, how do we kill probably 150,000 cattle a week in those periods to get them under 24 months. It's not possible. You can't market them, you can't sell them. And if they're killed then, we have no cattle to graze for the summer. So our summer beef is gone, we have nothing to supply customers with. So that 24 month rule will absolutely wipe out completely grass fed beef. It will also reduce the, the beef yield per carcass, so it'll be a major shortage of beef again. So that is a total disaster that has to be totally rejected by everybody here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And have we one more question? Just, or, yeah, one more here, and then we'll have to leave it at that, and we'll go to the panel just to address those. Um, hi. Um, two of us? Sorry. Um, Eddie Mitchell from IFA and Leitrim. Um, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't disagree with a lot of the figures that were mentioned today, but I would be wondering about the figures that you were thinking about in relation to looking forward especially in terms of land use and land use change. Um, what about equity? You know, We have this idea that we're going to solve all these problems, but we're not really considering equity. What's the impact of carrying out these measures on, on the West of Ireland, and from, from my perspective? Like you talked about forestry and emissions from forestry. And generally, it's understood now that the emissions from the forestry that we've been planting have been negative, even though we always considered them in the inventories as positive for a long time. You talk today about turning that again back to a positive. Now, we're looking at Quilche now, going to start buying land in the west of Ireland. How are we, we know we need to plant more trees in Ireland. We know we need to do all of these actions. But how are we going to protect communities in the west of Ireland or in places where land is a bit cheaper? How are we going to produce, protect people from market forces? Like, we don't seem to have any plan that can be assessed, or we don't seem to have any local control over these things. How are we going to do that? With a, are we going to have to go out and stop Quilcha ourselves? You know, there has to be a better way. There has to be a plan that can be assessed. Okay, thank you very much. So I suppose just summarising those questions, um, it's been said we're net emitters, but there's nothing done on carbon sequestration and the total carbon figure is 23 million tonnes, but there's zero taken for the carbon taken off. So maybe if we just address that first, maybe Lawrence, if you might just comment on that briefly. Yeah, so, you know, 
there's a lot of valid points in what's been said. You know, I suppose currently uh, land use emissions are in a different sector. They're in, in land, use, land use change. Unfortunately, they're currently a positive. And Mary Francis might want to comment on that. They're, still a, they're currently a positive. There is actually an increase rather than a decrease. For me, and it goes to a lot of the questions that have been trying, you know, put around, they're all very valid questions, is you know, the more we put numbers around this and the more we put robust numbers around this, I'm pretty confident that a lot of this is going to turn out, you know, the outcomes of that research are going to give positive solutions. So whether it's sequestration on mineral soils, whether it's carbon loss on peat soils, whether it's water table on peat soils, a lot of that, I think, once we have the numbers, and there's lots of projects between, you know, repeat, there's four or five very strong projects in this space. So I think we'll be in a robust space to have much more robust numbers for, for, the, uh, for the EPA in terms of land use, land use change. And Peter, do you want to comment briefly there, just from your perspective? Um, sure, sure. So, I mean, the... In the inventories are much more certain for things where we're burning fossil fuels because you know how much fossil fuel you bring in, you know how much of greenhouse gases that produces. They are much more uncertain for the things that matter to those in this audience here. Those uncertainties could well cut both ways in the long term. So although the stories that were shown here were all positive, we couldn't rule out a negative surprise whereby the number went the other way. Um, we need better numbers. We need numbers to know. I don't think the numbers are so far out that it's possible to, <coughs> it's possible to make an argument that agriculture and land use, land cover, forestry are net sequestering now but they may well be net emitting considerably less than is currently done. But it needs the science, it needs the measurements, it needs partnerships to measure these things right, to get it through the peer-reviewed literature to verify that those measurements are valid across a broad swathe of Irish uh, land. And then we can have a better basis to move forwards. Okay. All right, thank you. And then just very quickly, Bill, on the equity. Yeah, yeah the so impact on, on rural Ireland with these, some of these measures. So there's two questions I'd like to address that came in there. One is the 24 months. I haven't heard of a 24 months, so I don't know where that's coming from. What the objective is, is to reduce the average age of the typical animal at slaughter. So that is bringing down the average age in terms of it. So from a practical point of view, like anybody, you know, I think everybody would agree, you have a suckler herd out there, you know, at an individual farm level, 30 cows, there's a massive spread in terms of the performance of those animals. And some of them are just driving on in terms of their growth rate, their efficiency, they're coming to slaughter earlier, they're more profitable. If you look at the likes of what I mean about policy aligning with the objective, BDGP was criticised in the early days, right? But everybody recognised what it's trying to achieve, and ICBF can confirm the numbers. We used to be having 79, cows for every 79 calves for every 100 cows walking around the place. Well, now we're at 84. That's positive for a farmer point of view, and it's positive in terms of efficiency that Lawrence, I think, could, could, could answer better than I. Uh, so it's not a situation that the 30 months rule is a 24 months rule. It's not. It's a question of bringing the average age across those, even those that are being slaughtered under 24, bringing that down, those that are being slaughtered under 30, bringing that down similarly. On the equity piece, look, at the land use issue is going to be a huge thing, I think, going forward. Uh, the government plan is to um, publish shortly a, a review in terms of the current usage of our land and that that would feed into a phase two, which is the development of a land use uh, report in terms of a look at what are the issues for land and I think equity is something that is going to have to be dealt with that. You can't have a situation I suppose where you know environmental compliance is, is borne by the many for the issues of a few like that it has to there has to be equity in it but there are plans in terms of development of a land use uh, approach over the year to inform the Lulu CF target that's why it was parked that's uh, doing it but it's going to be complicated I suspect there'll be a lot of different views, but part of that will include engagement with people in terms of what the look at that should look and feel like. And Bill, will you might just briefly comment just on the tillage comment and that, like this encouragement to move to tillage away from livestock farming, just maybe yeah, comment so, on that. So I suppose where I come from the tillage is if you look at a balanced circular, everybody talks about circular systems, we use six, and, six million tonnes a year, six, six and a half million tonnes of feed, we produce 2.2. 2. 
So surely there's an opportunity there and a greater focus of, of delivery of some of that. You know, what you look at, for example, in terms of policy matching it is, you know, the protein aid is being a focus point because we're importing protein and your question for where from, uh, the likes of the Tillys incentives. I don't agree with the comment which was made in relation to doubling the carbon content of soils every 10 years. Why? Because if you have a very dry soil, very poor organic uh, content, and I've seen this, and Australia would have it, it's quite easy, massively move the dial there. We have high carbon soils. You're talking about, you know, um, we have a group looking at how would we develop carbon farming, but this, the issues we have to address are, first of all, what's the baseline? Two is how you measure it. Three is how you verify it, certify it, and finally how you finance it. So it's, not, it's much more complicated. And when you have, for example, a high peat soil with a high carbon content, you're moving the dial tiny, not doubling it, tiny amounts. That even everybody goes out in soil samples every few years now, you go out and you take a core, you know, every 40 or 50 steps, and that's as a representative sample. There's more variation in that sample than probably in the carbon movement. So it's not an easy thing to address but we certainly are looking at it with a view to credibility in terms of what we're saying. Uh, because there can't be false hopes or false expectations created. There has to be honesty in terms of what we, what okay. we claim, I think. All right, we have to leave it there. Uh, listen, I'd like to thank our panel of Peter, Mary Francis, Lawrence, Bill and Tyg. I think it's, it's, it's really obvious that science is set